All right, people, it's Monday. It's Monday of the NFL draft week. So we have one last, final, last Superflex rookie mock draft for you. And we had to bring on none other than my uncle. You know, some people say legally, some people disagree with that statement. But Mr. Andy Holloway, the fantasy footballers, they have just launched their Dynasty podcast, which is somehow already like number three podcast in the whole world. I'm not even just talking about the sports section, but they've done it again. They've taken over. Uh, so I figured this was a good time to get uh, one of their reps on here. Mr. Andy who tells me, you know, I'm not the Dynasty guy over here. So naturally, I thought I'd, you know, bring him on and try to embarrass him live on television. That's perfect. Yeah, uh, shouldn't be too high of a bar for me to be able to do that to you. Uh, what's going on, Andy? It's been a minute since you've been on the channel. How yeah. are uh, how are things going on over there? Um, what's what's going on? Good. You excited for the draft? Definitely excited for the draft. The Cardinals, we're local Cardinal fans, so that thing's been a been a mess, a circus. Not a lot to be excited about. I think we got some, you know, we got our new jerseys, so there's that. But uh, <laughs> otherwise, yeah, I'm excited to see what happens. I mean, I, I kind of was musing about the draft with the guys earlier a um, couple days ago, just you get to this point where you're right about to see what actually happens. It seems like the consensus gets tighter and tighter because you expect that you know what's going to happen. But we're surprised every year. I mean, um, the, the NFL GMs, they make mistakes all the time, just like we do uh, in the fantasy world. So it's like there's going to be surprises and there's going to be a lot of um, – I think confused fantasy rookie draft players that are sitting there going, now what do I do? You know, I had, I had an expectation for this player, you know, now they're a backup. Now they're in a platoon. Um, you know, now Richardson's going to sit a year, like what's going to happen. I I'm, I'm looking forward to the chaos, I guess, and actually having something tangible to talk about at this point versus just projection. Yeah. I mean, you guys are in one of like the, almost most confusing spots I feel like of any team in, in quite a while right there because you have so many teams surrounding you where um, they all have needs and demands and obviously you guys have a lot of needs as uh, you know just an overall Cardinals franchise but it doesn't feel like you're almost you guys are have so many holes that you don't actually feel like you need to plug any specific hole at this moment and there's so many teams that want to like get up and grab a quarterback and you have Kyler completely in flux like who knows if he even takes a snap for the Cardinals this year or again like in it's his career good, man Dude, it's not good anywhere. So I guess from a from a fandom perspective, at three, uh, are you you want to move back and co compile them picks, or like what do you want to do? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. If we if we ended up somehow moving back from three, you know, just gathering up some picks and then moving Hopkins in the draft and gathering more picks and just trying to accumulate players of which a jersey purchase may be eventually worthwhile. Yeah, that would be valuable in Arizona. I mean, we. We went from sitting here uh, 10 and 2, I think it was uh, you know, not last year but the year before, on top of the world to, you know, new GM, new head coach, Kyler injury, Buda Baker wants out, uh, you know, that that whole NFL survey comes out where we're the lowest ranked in everything. <laughs> we make people buy their meals. I mean, the players got to buy their meals. I don't know what we're doing in Arizona. Um but I'm watching a lot of Suns basketball right now. So I that's, was about to say that's like, where you, we're at right now. That. You got plenty <laughs> of jerseys you can buy. They just don't. Yeah. They just don't come with sleeves. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, fantasy footballers are there treating their employees better than the Arizona Cardinals. I mean, it's a mess, and yeah. uh, I'm 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 like you know a hopeless Cardinal fan where I, like I'm gonna find the silver lining in any situation. I've got nothing right now. I've got <laughs> nothing to find other than, like you said, like the hope that if you can accumulate picks, if somebody wants to come up to three, which, look, I don't – like if I was a betting man, I would probably bet that they end up stuck at three and they take, you know, Will Anderson or something. But I'd love the picks. I'd love to, to get that haul, you know, Tennessee or somebody come up and take it, and we'll see what happens. I know, you know, we have a brand-new general manager that I don't think – I think he wants to not screw up. I think that's why Hopkins hasn't been moved yet. I think that's why not a lot of press around the three yet. So maybe in the draft. Yeah, and it's it's tricky too because uh, if if we knew for sure, we, you know, we have all the reports and rumors coming out now. It's like, ah, is Stroud going to go two? Is he now going to fall right. into the draft? And now it's like, had you known it was one and two, teams that like Levis or Richardson can plan accordingly to move up to number three. But if we don't know until literally that pick is made, then it's like, okay, 
is some team really willing to alter their entire franchise in the course of 10 minutes while the Cardinals are on the clock? And it just gets it gets crazy. That's um, <laughs> that's actually like as a logistics type of, of, of guy, I'm sitting there thinking, how do you do it? Like, how do you pull off unless you have a bunch of framework that you've already discussed beforehand with these GMs? Like well, you I, I think they do, though. I think like a lot of the times these these trade up moves, like you see it with the Panthers and the Bears. A lot of times when you hear it on like Sports Center or someone talking about it afterwards, they pretty much have like the backbone or the skeleton of how a trade works, depending on like where you are in the draft and how far you want to move up for it. So I think a lot of the times they have it, but it also probably like extremely emotional where a GM might just be like, nah, never like also add that in on <laughs> right. the clock. And you're like, ah, like. I was going to do it, but now I don't want to add a third. Uh -huh. I don't know, dude. It's it's crazy. I'm like all the, all the sins of our fantasy trades that we commit sometimes. And we're like, yeah, I'll do it. And then they're like, wait, why'd you say yes so quickly? Yeah. Maybe saying yes so quick. Maybe, never mind. No, I'm pulling it. it back now. Yeah, I'm pulling yeah. it back. All right. Um, let's get into the mock draft in a second. I do want to ask quickly before we do, as I brought up before, you guys launched the new uh, Dynasty podcast. I know you, know you guys have played and you've, you've covered it. Uh, yeah. infrequently you know throughout the years in your podcast just taking different dynasty questions and talking about it but from a more holistic standpoint I guess I kind of wanted to just ask you about the thought process behind launching the podcast itself um, is it because you guys are starting to take more of an interest in dynasty or you're just seeing you know the shift in interest from viewers and audience because it's very obvious obvious from where we sit that you know a large part of the redraft and the season-long audience is um, shifting over and either moving their attention or doubling their attention down to fantasy. And this is like a way that they're putting more uh, chips on the table. So I guess just like major thought process of, of, of launching something like this and, and the undertaking. Yeah. I mean, I, I think our philosophy has always been to like kind of wait till something's the right time. You know, we've been asked to do dynasty at like greater levels in the past, mm -hmm. but kind of felt like the right time. You know, we, we need that permission to, to talk more about it. Like our show, like everything, everything we discuss about players and analysis about players, like there's there's so much crossover into the dynasty space when you're analyzing individual players. But um, you know, and we play dynasty. I mean, one of our two major leagues that we're we've been in forever are, is a dynasty league, and, and and we love it. But at the same time, it's that balance, right? Like if you're not playing dynasty, and we're predominantly a redraft show, we don't want to dig in too deep. So it was kind of like you know, this is the right time of year. We're releasing two regular episodes. There's some some room out there, I think, to to have a deep dive show to, to kind of get a runoff on those da dynasty tangents as much as we can, um, and then just having kind of the people here, um, the talent that's that's equipped to go and do that. You know, Kyle, um, he hosts that. Matthew Betts, uh, another one of our full time guys on that show. Both of these guys, you know, live and breathe dynasty. Um, they're in the thick of it all the time, and so it was it was just an opportunity, I think, that we. We thought that it was it was kind of the right time, and a lot of people are playing, like you said, they're not just playing redraft. Maybe they're not just playing dynasty, but they're mixing it together. And yeah, it was something we thought just was the right time. Yeah, we have a similar kind of um, kind of like a similar demo where the majority of our audience is season long focus, and it's about like community and engagement and stuff like that. We're seeing such a shift into people wanting to do it, and it's like the opportunity is laying there. So why not be? If we're already playing it, we're already passionate about it. Why not be the the people that kind of lead them to water, right? And from a business perspective, it makes a lot of sense. And it's not even from like an ill intended spot, but it's very easy to be like, "Hey, we're introducing you to this new game. You know, let's also give you the content for it." And now, you know, if you guys want extra value, you want more to it. We also have a product that relates to this thing. So you kind of introduce this new, almost like industry, but this niche within an industry where you kind of like take every part of the funnel in it you know yeah it's, it's always a i think a tough decision making thing because you're going to have the loudest most passionate voices playing thing you know playing dynasty right now at this time of the year right yeah. you get this huge groundswell in, in in august and september for all of the kind of um redraft players so you don't want to like overemphasize one specific niche you know that's a tough decision because it's like you know super flex is that same category where it's still a very small percentage of the total players and you can't make everybody happy all the time in like an hour a day of your show. But, yeah. <laughs> um, but there is like tremendous passion for it. And I think the market's grown specifically in dynasty to the point where it's really justifiable to, to kind of service those hardcore dynasty fans a little bit better. And the game has changed, you know, it's like, we, we've been doing this almost 10 years now and it's like, I think accessibility platforms, developing, uh, the ability to do dynasty leagues better, like just on your phone, 
Yep. All of all of the complexity is simplified now, so um, I think it's less daunting for people to jump in, and you know we'll we'll keep uh, you know kind of massaging our products as as the industry changes. I think. All right. Well, let's uh, let's massage some of these dynasty yeah. people out here. Let's. Well, this will be like um, a perfect mock, I'm sure, uh, for for the draft Thursday. Yeah, I mean that's the only kind of mocks that we do. Yeah, and I'm at I'm at three. You're right behind me. So yep. I'll go so ahead this is twelve teamer. We're going three rounds, uh, super flex. Everything else is pretty standard, half PPR. We've got 10 people joining us from the Discord. So we will rip it and let's run it. Yep, I went right behind you. I figured you would leave me some some scraps. I'm oh, hoping, for sure. Yeah. You know, as, as an unk, you got to feed the family <laughs> over here. <laughs> oh, Bijan, what a shock. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait for Jason's uh, Bijan destination reaction because he is – he's. He's tilting. I mean, either direction it'll be entertaining. Look, I think uh, I think it's going to be Bryce here. I'm going to take Bryce Young. Yeah, he feels like the only quarterback we know that's locked into where he's going, at least. Yeah, absolutely. I, I still don't really – maybe you have a gauge on what Houston's going to do in this world, but it seems so not beneficial to them to get it out there that they wouldn't want to take a quarterback there. It seems like if they – even if they didn't, They'd want the public to think they were. Yeah, I I, uh, I almost feel like the sentiment behind closed doors is that these quarterbacks are a tier below Bryce Young now. And I think with where Houston is, they might feel comfortable moving back from three or from two or taking who they want it to. And then because they have that 12th overall pick moving back up. So it's almost like they don't need to stretch to get their guy at two because they might just be able to get them you know, any time within the top 10, it won't be tough for them to uh, to move in. But, like, I don't know. Stroud, to me, is a clear two here. So I took him at the 104 yeah. because I don't think he drops, you know, lower than the third or fourth overall pick. And when I'm talking about super flex guys, yeah, Young and Stroud might not have the upside that, like, an Anthony Richardson does. But I'm, I'm not really – I'm not shooting for upside with my QB two. I just want like a safe player that I know will give me, you know, 17 to 18 points for the next whatever decade. Well, and you know, he's, he's, he's probably going to start year one, you mm -hmm. know, as opposed to Richardson, maybe sitting if he ends up in Seattle or something. Let's see here. Well, I'm, I'm going to go with a guy that I think I believe in a little bit more than everybody out there who wants to throw shade on it, but I'm going to take, I'm going to take Jalen Hyatt here. So I, I, you know, on film, so explosive, led the NCAA and what 30, 40 and 50 yard catches this year. He's an eye test guy for me. Uh, I've seen kind of a wide variety of opinion on him. Even, even people preferring Tillman to him talent wise, but you went with downs right after me. Yeah. Uh, two like just completely different styles of player. Hyatt, uh, Hyatt, I like. I almost feel like he got so much hype in the beginning of the, uh, the pre-draft process, and now he's almost underrated because he is came the, in a little under. The pendulum has swung too far. Yeah, I I just feel like he's someone who is going to benefit from a landing spot, and I can't really predict it, but he just That's feels the hard like, part. Yeah, I I think he might be the one that the charge. Like you look at the teams that need a field stretcher, and he's the type of player. Like this class is basically built up of wide receivers that are like very specific to roles. You know, there's not like a bunch of alphas. There's there's the Josh Downs who's small and he's going to play the slot and JSN is likely going to play the slot and Hyatt's uh, a team. If you need a field stretcher, I'm thinking like the chargers, I'm thinking Buffalo bills. I'm thinking like, those are the teams that need an outside guy that can stretch the field. And like, that's what he I plays. think his best role is going to be. So I feel like if I had to guess one player landing in a really good spot, it's Jalen Hyatt. Yeah. Yeah. That, it should be interesting. Are you, I don't know where you're at with downs. Are you pretty, obviously you took them here. Yeah. Um, are you are you pretty excited about his potential? I am. I, I love Josh Downs. He was uh he was probably my favorite player to watch on film. I think at the wide receiver position, the dude is just so tough for how. I, I mean, I was so disappointed when he came in at like 171 pounds because I feel like I don't know, the uphill battle to be like a real player at that size in the NFL is is tough. But um, I'm hoping my Falcons draft him. You know, so even if he's not great for fantasy, I, I, I'm very confident that he's going to be like a great NFL player. And I do feel like that's probably a lot of these guys. Um, like I love that pick, Tyler Scott. He's one of my favorite like undersized wide receivers in this class. A lot of them might just end up being better NFL there's, players. There's a lot of undersized receivers in this class. It's like that's all there is. There's Maybe like this is the new guy. NFL though. I mean, I, I know yeah. the average weight and and some of those measurables have gone down over the last ten years. I was like Roshan. Um, yeah. So Josh Downs is. Uh, as long as he gets the capital, like I think he'll be a top 50 pick. If he's linked to any sort of quarterback that's, you know, capable of throwing the ball, like I'm, I'm in on downs. I, I'm, I'm okay with 
putting some chips down on, on guys that I really, really like from film on being outliers. Where where do you have downs in your wide receiver rookie rankings right now? Uh is he like do you like Zay Flowers as well or I do like Zay Flowers. I think I have Flowers a little bit above downs only because I'm expecting Flowers to or at least I think if one of them is going to get first round capital, it's probably going to be Zay Flowers. Uh, it, it's I don't know, dude. It's kind of tough to decipher between the two of them. I almost feel like I'm just going to let the the draft kind of decide between the two. They're in the same tier for me, so I don't want to, you know, like go crazy based on like my just like tape evaluation there. Uh, but I think Flowers yeah. probably ends up with better draft capital. It's funny because there's been this history recently. I think of uh, you know these super talents ending up in kind of bad situations after the draft is over and then there's that doubt whether it was Garrett Wilson or Jalen Waddle last couple of years where it's like, Oh man, they went to the wrong place, but we should have believed <laughs> that I know, they were going to be just fine. It's crazy. Cause like we mess up so much as people that play fantasy and then you're like, you got to learn from your mistakes. And then, <laughs> and then it's like, the I never one. really sit down and, and I'm like, okay, how do I apply exactly what I messed up last year and do it to this year's rookie class? Um, and I think, you know, the, in this time of like, long-term analyzing what we think is going to happen, I think it messes with our heads a little bit. It's like really hard to go from February, March, April, and then all of a sudden you're drafting, everything changes. It's like have the courage to, to go against consensus a little bit and believe in the talent that you saw in film or that you scouted for the last couple months. Yeah, I mean the problem with the problem with what we do for work is that we're just like chronically – we're just chronically living in fantasy football world, man. It's It's – it's such a weird little like bubble slash cycle to be in, you know, everything, every player and every ranking is just so sensitive to these tiny little things happen. And we're so reactive to it that like, I don't know, you find yourself loving a player and then one small thing happens and your entire viewpoint of them changes when that absolutely should not be the case, but that's, that's the world we live in here. Yeah. Um, you're right. Josh down. So I, I have downs as my wide receiver five in my rankings right okay. now. I have. So I'm guessing JSN, flowers is like four for you or something or yeah i've i've Zay flowers four and josh downs right behind him at uh at five and then i think hyatt's probably right after him we had hooker at two five we got the string of running backs where this class is is difficult to get a gauge on right now because all of those running backs really like from tank bigsby all the way to tajay spears wouldn't surprise me if any of those dudes ended up going in the fifth or sixth round wouldn't surprise me if any of them went you know, early round three and we don't yeah. have a landing spot. So it's so, so hard to decipher. Are there any like running backs in that group there that you are particularly higher on than the rest of them? Probably Tucker, uh, okay. probably Tucker. And then I, I might like Evans a little bit more, but I feel like I'm going to get Isaiah Spillard with Evans where his draft <laughs> capital is going to be like much lower than, than I thought. And like you said, these guys could all get pushed down. Like if the, if the greater perception of the NFL GMs, is that you know they're all in the same kind of category or that I can wait and wait and wait to get one of these guys. We may be a little bit, this might be this group that's all around behind where we think they're going to go, putting doubt in our minds for the fantasy drafts, but maybe having the same type of value to that actual NFL team. So that's a little bit of uh, of my concern with with jumping in on those. It'll be interesting to see. Hooker yeah. at 205, I mean, I like that pick though. Are you... Are you in on his his potential? I mean, he can run a little bit once he gets healthy. I yeah. think it's going to be, you know, maybe later in the first round you end up with a better team, uh, but maybe a less clear starting situation. Yeah, he's another dude where I have no, I have no real sense of what's like accurate in the reporting. Does yeah, I, we you start to see mock drafts that are all over the place at this point, where like Hooker's in the first round, he's a top fifteen pick, and I'm like, I don't. I don't think that's real, but is he going to drop to the end of the second round? Probably not. Um, he's another one where I'm probably going to let draft capital kind of dictate the way. I'm, I'm definitely in on him as a talent. Like, there's, I'm not fading him for the for anything that I saw on tape or anything like that. But um, yeah. him, him being the 55th pick is going to be a little oh, bit yeah. different than him being someone who lands at the end of the first round. Because that, you know, if a team uses first round capital on a player, they have a, they get one of those a year. You know, so they have a lot of confidence in in using it on a player like that. So you draft Hooker in the end of the first round, and you're saying, okay, we think this guy there's a good chance he's the future of our quarterback position so that that gives me a little bit of an outlook but I think like mid second round is exactly where uh we're probably gonna be looking at him in super flex drafts I think if he gets the draft capital he's gonna shoot up and that's the other thing with like all these uncertain players right like downs I like but question marks galore like everyone in front of hooker lots of question marks so that means uh, a dude like hooker 
could go all the way as high as like the 110, the 111 in rookie drafts, and I'd probably be okay with it just because of the lack of clarity um, certainty around everywhere those else. other guys. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it's 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 ugly. And then once we get into the third round, it's a lot more of the same. Um Tyler Scott, your fan. I love that dude. Yeah, absolutely. Uh was he 5'11, 180? Um I like <laughs> dude, Mims in the third, though. Like it would have been really, really cool to get Mims, I think, at three oh three. I he's another guy that I think I'm a little higher than others are. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of uh, a lot of Mims love. I don't I, I don't know, you know, coming out of that uh offensive system, it feels like it's one that just like spreads out and a guy that flies like him is going to excel. I don't know how great of like a, a route runner he is, but all these guys come with their question marks. So I, I, Mims is there, Tyler Scott's interesting. Uh Roshan Johnson's a dude that's probably going to be a better real life player than fantasy player, but you know, maybe he backs his way into one of those like Jamal Williams types years where he goes crazy via the touchdowns. Um he got a couple tight ends. And, you know, towards the end of the third round in rookie drafts is just an absolute crapshoot. And most of those guys aren't going to hit. But I don't know. Overall, I'm, I'm not, like, too excited about this about this class. Do you have any, like, general strategies that you tend to use in rookie drafts? Like, you know, if you're outside of, like, the 106 or something like that, are you trying to move until next year? Or you have, like, different pockets <laughs> of tiers that you're trying to maneuver around? Yeah, I, I, the only thing I'll say is that historically, like, especially in our dynasty league, the the kind of questionable quarterbacks have dropped too far. You know, even in like, I'm not talking super flex, I'm talking in one quarterback leagues, in rookie drafts, they end up dropping to places where, you know, you look back in a couple of years and you're like, well, that, that was somebody that I knew was going to have some production at the NFL level. We're always competing to have depth at quarterback. And it was in a sea of a bunch of, uh, of kind of flame outs. And yet they keep dropping and they keep dropping. So, I think um, in this draft that could end up being the Will Levises, um, if the destination isn't it something that people have fallen in love with, love with, or or Hooker in that situation where I'm gonna at least look twice at those guys because I don't want to be looking back in a couple of years with these 50-50 or worse prospects in the second third round of rookie drafts where I could have taken a contributor for my team, and so um, I know we all want like the next superstar at all times and to find that diamond in the rough, but like. You know, the fact is there's just not that many of them. Like, you're, you're playing a more dangerous game. And so if a quarterback looks like they have a path to production, um, I, I think I'm going to look that direction a little bit more than maybe I did early when I was playing some of these dynasty rookies. Yeah, I think that was, like, a, a problem for, uh, I mean, lots of players in lots of leagues and stuff. Even, even in the leagues that I play in that are super flex, guys like Jalen Hurts, you know, those guys were falling into the middle end of the second round. Um, so in one quarterback leagues, they go – super super late and i think we're starting to see the tide switch a little bit just because you look at redraft and you needed dudes like josh allen or mahomes or hurts or one of those guys this year in one quarterback redraft to actually succeed so i think we've kind of flipped the switch a little bit with how we're drafting these rookie quarterbacks no matter you know what the league type is i think we'll see anthony richardson go you know as like a top seven eight pick in in one quarterback rookie uh drafts which is kind of crazy outside of like Bryce Young and Stroud when you look at the quarterbacks like Levis or Richardson uh is that a is that a spot where you're just again letting you know the NFL draft kind of dictate where you're drafting them in your rookie drafts or do you actually like kind of dive in and you you know because a lot of people take stances they're like I hate Will Levis I'm not drafting him on my fantasy team I'm just like we've been so wrong on so many top 10 quarterbacks that like I'm not going to be the one that decides that I just I'm just going to kind of flip a coin and see if he works out yeah, I mean, I think if you have a really extreme view on their talent, then then you should go with it. But, um, you know, if, it, if it's in the middle, then maybe that situation dictates it. I know in years past, you've had people give far too much credence to the landing spot, even though you know the player's talented. Like I said, Jalen Waddell, like in our dynasty draft that year, you know, Trey Sermon and the perfect situation, he went ahead of Jalen Waddell. So, you know, Anthony Richardson, somebody that it's like, if you believe in the talent of Anthony Richardson – and you combine that with what fantasy football production is all about, like that's that's kind of a can't miss situation if you really believe that. So I don't know if Richardson's landing spot's gonna mess with me too much, other than just being realistic about like, okay, if he goes to Seattle at five, then I'm waiting a year to get something from him. But but like if you ultimately believe that that player has elite ability, then you just gotta you gotta pull the trigger and maybe ignore some of that landing spot stuff if they're if they're one of you know, I think the Eagles GM was it that came out and said very few first round grades in this draft. Like if it's in your mind, if there's like putting it in the fantasy 
world, if there's five guys that have that talent that you're like, okay, that guy's like a can't miss guy, then I think you just put your head down and take them and just kind of ignore the backlash that comes with being drafted by a team you don't believe in. Yeah, no, I hear you. I, I, it, it's it's almost like you need those guys in order to win the championship, even if you can like acknowledge that, hey, there's you know a 30% chance that this guy hits, but you still need to be within that 30% in order to shoot for the championship. And that's, you know, that's what this class is probably going to be like when we – turn around and look back it's gonna be really interesting to see how like the the quarterback class of uh of this year plays itself out because more so maybe this is the case every year I guess I guess last year was kind of interesting too even though everyone ended up dropping but this is one of the more like polarizing years for QBs uh having four of them arguably in the top 10 so it should be fun looking back on it um we'll wrap it up there I know you got uh some stuff going on over there no it's been fun yeah dude uh I'll Probably going to hit you back up to come on during the summer and talk some, you know, some redraft, some other fantasy stuff, uh, chop it up on a, a longer forum here. Sure. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, get you on here and, and promote the Dynasty podcast, obviously, because that's I appreciate you know, your guys' new venture. And um, it's cool to see you guys getting in there. And it's obviously good for the entire community because the more eyeballs we have on it, the more, you know, the, uh, the more love goes around. Uh, uh, no question. So, no question. There's a lot of a uh, lot of time in the day. We've got a lot of a lot of good content to consume and. And um, I love seeing, you know, Dynasty is a format where people are really passionate. You know, you get yeah. more nuance in there and people get so excited. And, and that's what makes fantasy fun. So, um, no, I appreciate it. The draft's going to be awesome. Looking forward to it. Cardinals, trade that thing back. Yep. Find one desperate team that wants number three. Let's go. Falcons. I'll let, that, that'll work. Cool. That'll Atlanta. work. Let's do it. I, I don't even know who I want us to trade up for, but, like, let's, <laughs> let's send it. Just let's go, go do it. Let's just go do it. Yeah, let's, just, let's do the damn thing. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. All right, Andy, uh, thank you again for your time. Uh, everyone out there that's not already subscribed to their channel, of course, do so. I will link the new Dynasty Fantasy podcast that they got going on down below as well. Hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to our channel if you are new, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Bye-bye.